Russia's unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine is a tectonic event that is reshaping Russia's relationship with the West and China and more broadly in ways that are unfolding and remain highly uncertain. Escalation of the conflict to a military confrontation between Russia and the West carries the greater risk which the world has not faced in decades. These alarming remarks were publicly cited in Washington's intelligence assessment of Russia's regional and global objectives for 2023, as we have already entered into the second year of conflict in Europe's most eastern flank. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Hassan and welcome to the 14th edition of TV7 Europa Stands. Joining us to dissect Europe's state of internal and foreign affairs are Professor Uri Rosenthal, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Good afternoon. Good afternoon indeed. Also joining us is Professor Jacek Japutovic, who is the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland. Good afternoon. Also joining us is Ambassador Sven Sakov, who is the former Undersecretary of Defense Policy at the Ministry of Defense of Estonia and incumbent Ambassador of Estonia here in Helsinki. Good to be here. And Mr. Peter Ostman, who is the Deputy Member of Foreign Affairs Committee here in Finland's Parliament and former President of the European Christian Political Movement in the European Parliament. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, and welcome to Helsinki. Uh, <laughs> indeed, thank you for having us. And uh, I would like to start uh, with you, Professor Rosenthal. Uh, Russia's war versus Ukraine has, of course, uh, entered its second year. We already discussed it uh, at some what length in our previous production. And I'd like to uh, start uh, by asking you, to what degree uh, is the, the current state of European and Western um, response uh, in support of Ukraine, of course, in this context uh, versus Russia um, sufficient? Let me, let me, uh, thank you for the question. Let me start by saying that when I go back to just over one year ago, February last year, um, I would say that among the many m miscalculations on the part of Moscow, Putin, was the fact about <coughs> Western resolve. And we can talk about a lot of hiccups, a lot of obstacles in that respect, but <coughs> eventually I would say, after all, that the resolve on the part of the West U.S. And, and Europe within the NATO has been beyond expectation. And to give some few observations first, of course we remember uh, President Obama saying uh, Europe should go from consuming security to producing it. Now, you can say whatever you want, but after all, Germany, the Zeitenwende, 100 billion of euros in defense. My own small country, which was lagging behind in the NATO expenditures, 1.4% has now risen with interior difficulties because suddenly we have to, the armed forces have to go from severe cutbacks over many years to have an abundance of money actually to be spent. When I look at Europe by itself, of course, uh, you could uh, paraphrase uh, George Orwell, all nations, all European member states are equal, <coughs> but some are more equal than others. Uh, Poland, Estonia are among the countries within the European Union, which of course have much more, uh, much more uh, perseverance in the security domain than some other countries, a little bit more remote from Russia. But overall, you could say it's never enough, and there are quite some difficulties and obstacles, but uh, to take it all together, um, I think that uh, Mr. Putin in Moscow must be extremely disappointed and frustrated about the way in which the West is responding. And that it will, at a certain moment, become more difficult to keep this uh, resolve. 
We don't know. You might <coughs> expect it. But mm -hmm. the success is there in a way. Professor Chaputovic? I agree. Uh, the West is united. I think that we just observed uh, last month uh, American leadership. It's very important. A visit of President Biden to Kiev and to Warsaw mm -hmm. and to yeah. address presidents of nine countries of the region was important, important signal for Russia, for others, that Americans will support Ukraine. I remember it was 30 years ago, so-called uh, Kiev chicken speech of President Bush. It was not a chicken visit, if I may compare, of President Biden. So we uh, feel that the Americans, particularly the uh, Democrats and President Biden, invested political career in the success of Ukraine. It's very important that it also helped to mobilize Western societies and uh, leaders um, of states, Western states, to increase support for Ukraine, mm -hmm. military support. Ammunition is very important now. European Union must invest in that to maintain uh, uh, provisions for Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. Leopard tanks, very important decisions by the Germans to provide for Ukraine. And also, we are talking about planes. It was the decision of Polish Prime Minister to provide first uh, planes for the moment, MiG, Russian, old style, but in future, maybe F-16. Uh, because if we won't support Ukraine, there is a risk that uh, the Ukraine may lose that war, and uh, the implications for global order will be enormous and very negative one. So there's, there is an understanding of that s important stake which is in that war. The intelligence reports do indicate that the threat of Ukraine losing in the long haul is still there. It's very much alive. And noting also that the next in lines are, of course, Poland, Estonia, and other uh, NATO member states. And therefore, when we're looking at this challenge at hand, to what degree is the European fatigue threatening at this stage, Ambassador Sakov? Well, I think we really haven't really got started yet. I mean, we, um, Uri said that uh, uh, for Putin, the European resolve was beyond expectation. I think we should be look uh, at why the expectations were so low. And I would say there's a good reason for that. The West, Europe, has been meek and underwhelming when it comes to actually countering Russian aggression before. Uh, look at that in uh, 30 years ago. Uh, when Russia was at its weakest, it started Abkhazia, Transnistria, South Ossetia, frozen conflicts in order to come back. And they have come back to two of them. It um, uh, started in 1995, a brutal war in Chechnya, internally, but it showed how brutal Russian warfare is, mm -hmm. uh, how devastating it is. Uh, 2008, Georgia, no repercussions from the West couple of months of bad diplomacy and kind of a bit of cold shoulder, but everything went back to normal. Uh, then uh, move on, 2014, Crimea, Donbass. Now, let's think back now if those same sanctions what have been applied now would have been applied there in 2014. Uh, we would not have this kind of situation where we are now. Syria, again, we saw basically the, uh, uh, how uh, uh, inhumane uh, Russian warfare is uh, uh, bombing uh, hospitals and so forth, coming back to bomb also in order to kill the rescuers. So, okay, no, I think this is a good reason why Putin miscalculated because the West gave him all the reasons to miscalculate. Now, when it comes to the European resolve as we see it right now, uh, they, yes, uh, it has been better than expected, but when we look at from nowadays point of view, vantage point. I would say it's too little, too late, too piecemeal. Uh, why? Because there is so much self-deterrence. Meaning, oh, we cannot do that because it's going to be escalatory. Which is, by definition, is wrong because escalation means if a new type of war weapon is introduced into the battlefield. Escalation cannot be when you provide a victim of aggression the same type of weapon that aggressor already uses. With that being said, and I'd like to challenge that point <laughs> particularly, usually when you enter into battle, you want to know what you enter into. Uh, unpredictability is uh, a way to deter even more uh, enemies from engaging, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 
according to all intelligence reports, nobody knows what's going to happen if the West actually engages into war with Russia. So what would determine the premise for such a scenario to occur if not to reach a point actually of, of return in which de-escalation can occur? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I do not know that anyone has any ever really seriously proposed that the West, NATO, or European Union, or anyone else should actually engage themselves in a war. We're actually talking about giving the victims of aggression the means to actually withstand the, uh, the aggression. My country has done its part. Uh, we have sent, uh, Estonia has sent 1% of the GDP worth of military equipment uh, to um, uh, Ukraine. I have done a back the envelope calculation that if all the EU and North American countries would do the same, that would amount to 400 billion euros worth of military kit. And of course, then the problem is that Europe has no spares left, the storage is empty, because Europe in general has not invested in defense in the last 30 years. I come from a country which has done it in the last 30 years. We are our in the country, Finland, which has done that for, what, 70 years. Uh, it is a good place to actually talk about how modern warfare, which looks very much like the old one, actually works. Indeed, uh, Mr. Ostman, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. Obviously, Finland is no stranger. Uh, to warfare vis-a-vis -vis Russia, considering also the fact that it did engage in the winter wars and uh, uh, s managed to, to gain a certain um, victory within that context, ultimately, of course, losing Karelia, which was very dear to the hearts of many Finns, but uh, nonetheless, it, it maintained independence for uh, many years thereafter. Uh, to what degree do you see this history reoccurring to a certain degree, uh, even though today's obviously Western support is far larger than what Finland had at the time? Well, f uh, Finland, uh, we have our own experience and especially our forefathers. My father was both in the Winter War and also uh, when the Second World War continued 1940 and further on. Uh, uh, but when we look upon this situation now, I had like to go back to the uh, last seat here was it in the early fall when I was participating into the discussion here and uh, the main issue uh, or the question in the public debate was then that will Europe stand united? Will the West stand united? Uh, since the energy prices were rising and the infla inflation was rising and there were many people that were doubting that should Europe really stand united? Now we have the result. Uh, the year has gone and and we are still here and we are united and I think that uh, and I hope that also America will be united with the with the, the European Union countries uh, but of course now Finland is in the process that we are joining NATO where we have made our decisions we had the uh, the last plenary week we made the final decision and then it's up to our president to sign the documents I think he got three months and he said that he he will not uh, uh, he, he will do it quite quickly so in the next days maybe or next weeks we can see that he will sign the documents and Finland hopefully will become a member of NATO because when w the process started in Finland we were told that now is the open door days yeah. in NATO please colleagues in NATO open the doors for mm -hmm. Sweden and Finland mm -hmm. because that's how we interpreted it uh, we had to make a quick decision and we were relying on these promises that uh, NATO has opened door for Western countries like Finland and Sweden. But then when it comes to uh, how will, how do we think that this will continue? The will, will Europe stand united? I really hope that many other European countries like Estonia could, could really support strongly Ukraine uh, until the, <laughs> the very end. Uh, I don't remember which um, uh, who it was that said, I think it was uh, the European president, Ursula von der Leyen, that, that stated that EU will remain united until, as long as it takes, as long as it takes. Okay, y you can interpret that as long as it takes in many ways. We don't know the final results. And so long as the winter stays mild. 
Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Professor Rosenthal, I'd, I'd like to ask you from, from that perspective, and uh, we will touch on uh, the Swedish and, and Finnish accession into yes, NATO because that is quite significant, and there is uh, quite the challenge there uh, within the composition of NATO, considering the fact that Absolutely. Turkey, uh, which Absolutely. happens to be the only military <coughs> willing to sacrifice, um, is currently in a position where it's not very much willing to accept <coughs> Sweden uh, because of uh, not only religious per, uh, reasons, but also other reasons uh, beyond. Uh, right before we touch on that, I'd like to hear one more point because it seems like there is an issue with uh, Western countries wanting to commit more, uh, considering the fact that those hundreds of billions of euros that you talked about just uh, a couple of weeks ago. We also heard the British uh, Premier speaking about another six billion uh, pounds. Where is that coming uh, at a time when the militaries in Europe, they're weak? There are only three primary militaries in Europe today, uh, first tier, second tier. One is not a member NATO state, happens to be Finland. Uh, the second one happens to be Turkey, which is not really Europe. And then the third one is uh, Poland alongside the UK, which has diminished its uh, or depleted its uh, power. So everybody are basically subject to American umbrella. Where is that heading to? Is this now going to alter the way European nations are once again thinking, considering the fact that there is a true threat lurking in the East? Well, you actually... Um in a way encourage me to go global on your question. And then we are talking the situation of the United States. It is sometimes said very bluntly, very bluntly, that eventually we will see the following situation. There will be a table where the Russians and the Americans are negotiating. Zelensky is sitting there but the negotiations are between Washington and Moscow, and Europe is going to pay. That's a global situation in a way. And when I looked at the resolve on the Western side, and you are hinting at that, I would say that uh, for me one of the big questions is about the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And this, of course, brings in the global picture about the United States, for which the first and foremost challenge at the moment is rather China, is rather um, China than the situation in Europe. I'm very, very uh, fierce on that, or rather intense on that, and I may be mistaken, but in any case, the United States have their heavy burdens, of course, on our end here, but also in the Pacific. And that is something which is worrying me. And taking into consideration the internal domestic political scene in the United States, I would, it would be one of those things which go beyond a hiccup and beyond just an obstacle. Uh, uh, in the sphere of Western resolve. So that would be my tentative answer into your direction. Mm -hmm. I agree that the United States, they want European countries to contribute more uh, financially, militarily to, uh, to that war, to support Ukraine. And you can hear from a Republican side that uh, uh, the war, uh, Russian war in Ukraine, it's not in American interest, it is in European interest. Uh, I agree with you that uh, the United States looks at Pacifica China, but in order to maintain support for the United States of European countries, they have to be involved here. Hmm. The United States will do nothing without European support in this confrontation, future confrontation with China. So we are allies, alli allies. we have to take into consideration our interest, both sides of the Pacific. When you look at Europe, Central European countries are very much in favor in taking into account American interests, global interests, not only 
the one uh, c connected to that war. For example, Poland organized in uh, 2019 the so-called uh, uh, East um, uh, Middle East Conference in supporting mm. both Israel, United States, which paved uh, the uh, way to Abraham Accords, for example. It was not maybe in the interest of Europe to go that way, but in general interest of global order, particularly the United States and Israel, because it's another issue when we can uh, differ, I mean, Europeans and the Americans, in, per in taking into consideration uh, uh, security interest of, of Israel. And China is the main issue, of course. We are ready to support the United States in global confrontation with, with China, uh, treat it as a, as, a, as, a, as a threat in future. We can observe also a new axis, axis uh, China, Russia, Iran, Belarus, currently Saudi Arabia, uh, <coughs> Gulf countries, which, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, China plays a, a role of a mediator between Iran and uh, these Arab countries. It, it's quite a mm, negative development from the b uh, side of a democratic world. But generally, my point is that... Even Ameri though that is, uh, some may say, and this is at least from what I heard from Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, the consequence of weak leadership and Absolutely. misinterpretation of what needs to be done, uh, which ultimately brought about to that reality. I agree. I, it was a mistake of uh, the American, uh, <coughs> so to say, uh, president and administration, uh, which has yes, withdrawal from that uh, criticism, maybe to, to, to strong criticisms of that countries. And, but now, um, yes, they understood, they want to correct, I mean the Americans, the uh, administration, and we have to support them because it's a positive signal to us. Yeah. Indeed. Ambassador? I mean, this is actually uh, the really at its core is a question about what type of future security architecture in Europe we're going to have. And that is determined by how this war ends. If the war ends in a way where the imp Russian imperialist attitude and policies have been decisively defeated in the battlefield, so that every babushka in every Siberian village knows that we were beaten, then we have one path. If it is not, and this uh, will be considered in Russia, and spinned, of course, that way as a great victory, uh, then there will be others. Uh, we have s if we have learned anything from the history of Europe in the last 100 years, is that aggressor never stops. One day it has to be stopped, but the price is going up all the time. We do not know where it's going. This is, you know, we did, I mean, no world war has been called <coughs> world war from the first day. I would say really the second world war became a global world war during the, um, the attack on the Pearl Harbor on the 7th of, de of December 1941 mm. only. Before that, it was a European war. Then it became a world war. Uh, so I think we have a lot of um, uh, unanswered um, questions then. And then, uh, what is the role of NATO in this future security architecture of Europe, for example? Because what NATO is? NATO is actually a way to tie the defense and security of the United States and Canada on one side of the Atlantic together with European ones. And we very clearly need that to continue from a European perspective. And I think it's also important from a US perspective to have allies, strong allies. And here's the, the rub. As I said previously, that uh, Europe has underfunded its defense for many decades, cashed in the peace dividend. And uh, uh, so we are in a position where a lot of people talk about European strategic autonomy can have very different meanings. But one meaning is in defense uh, and security. And now my call usually has been to those people who are calling for European strategic autonomy in defense and security is that put your money in their own office. It's not about words. Words are cheap. We need to invest in that. Estonia has uh, been, at in terms of defense spending, at 2% last 10 years. Now we're at 3%. Poland is, I don't know where, 5% probably already, uh, leading the way uh, in, 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 in basically uh, arming itself. And this is the way. And that will basically mean that we'll be able to do our part of a bargain 
what Americans have called actually since the times of John F. A. A. Kennedy, that mm. Europe should do more militarily. Indeed. Well, uh, it's of course a double-edged sword. Uh, with regard to your reference to Pearl Harbor, maybe I'd pull it a little bit backwards to the invasion of Japan into the Dutch Indies, of course, that uh, uh, might be quite an interesting analogy, but we can deliberate that at another time. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Ostman, when we look at <coughs> the picture of Europe today, is Finland safer? Mm -hmm. Taking into account, of course, the variables, is Finland safer as part of NATO? Of course, we, th we think and hope that we are safe, <coughs> because otherwise we wouldn't have done this decision. Uh, if I remember correctly, when we had the voting, 184 of the member of, uh, out of 200 voted uh, for it, and seven were against and some were, were not uh, in, uh, voting at that day. But 184, it's over 90 percent of the members of the Finnish parliament. And of course, when we make uh, such a such a big this and important decision we hope that we are doing the, the right thing but at the same time i remind our european neighbors and uh, already nato uh, allies that please have the door open since you promised that the doors are open mm. <coughs> indeed I, well i, I, the I want question to then brings up uh, and, and again, but uh, let, let, let me continue for a while. At the same time, I, I don't want to blame any other countries because uh, we can see here that Europe, we have made a lot of mistakes. We have been naive. 2008, we were naive. Uh, 2014, we, Europe uh, was way too naive. But now we, we were shocked and we became awake, but it took some weeks to to, to gather and to, to join together and to find solutions. And we are still looking for solutions for the future. But instead of uh, being in public debates where we are blaming each other or counting how much did you pay and on the fence last year and the, during the, the, the 10 last years and look at us how good we are. I don't think that is a good solution for Europe in the future and for the common framework. and, and so I, I, I would ask for to calm down and come together, discuss together, and even with our uh, friends in America. Instead of blaming them or saying that they are doing their mistakes, we should invite them for negotiations and really, really try our very best to find solutions together because United States needs Europe and Europe needs United States in the future. The transatlantic uh, alliance is obviously vital, but I'd, I'd like to um, bring to the table, of course, the discussion of Sweden and Finland right now. Yeah. And uh, when we look at the picture, Sweden is going to be the third largest military in the NATO alliance uh, within the context, of course, of, of uh, uh, fighting force and, and other elements within that. Uh, the, the Swedish contribution, technologically speaking, is obviously quite significant. But uh, it seems like uh, the, uh, the Turks are not very keen, <laughs> at least not on, on the Swedish uh, role in this uh, uh, mix. <clears throat> Is the, uh, the, the disconnect or the uh, cultural differences really that big of an issue? Or what, what is it about? I wouldn't say that. I think it's more kind of domestic uh, uh, politic for Turkey. We know that there is an election coming up and uh, as a politician Erdogan, uh, he wants to, to find something to blame somebody for something and, and also to collect more support in his home country. Of course, there might be some, some uh, mistakes done in Sweden also. Uh, we know when this process started that Finland and Sweden, we were united and we said that we, we want to walk together hand in hand into NATO. And we still have this goal. But in also in the public debate, there are people who are trying to do, uh, differ us in this process. And if, if uh, Erdogan is not differing us, then there's uh, Hungary differing us, or then there is the public media differing us. But uh, we have our will together with the Swedish colleagues that we would join NATO together. The Foreign Affairs Committee was visiting in Sweden uh, three, four weeks ago, and we had a good discussions together. And last week I had a, a guest visiting from, from Sweden also, who is a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So we, we have a common will. It's up to NATO to ratify us once together. Uh, Ambassador Sarkov, very briefly, 
just want to um, assure my good friend here that uh, the NATO doors are open. Ratification process of uh, Finland and Sweden has only run its uh, eight months. Uh, for Estonia, for example, back in 2013-14, it was 14 months, so it has been lightning speed. Uh, Estonian parliament was the first parliament to ratify. Uh, Canada and Denmark have different provisions in terms of how we do it. We were the first one uh, on the second day uh, uh, of when the actual ratification was, um, it was uh, happening. Now, we, uh, uh, and, and I would say that from the NATO side, no one really is trying to separate Finland and Sweden. Um, no. I think very clearly it is very well said by uh, Prime Minister Sanna Marini, who said that it is every, in everybody's interest that we join uh, together. Now, of course, the question is, what will happen if a country X, Y, or Z, or actually, uh, for example, uh, Turkey will just ratify one? And this is kind of uh, a very question, the crux of the issue, uh, and of course, above my pay grade. So. Professor Rosenthal? Finland and Sweden uh, entering NATO, I would agree with uh, uh, Ms. Osman that uh, uh, maybe, probably, after the elections in May in Turkey, things might change. And uh, uh, I, I, I would say it actually um, <coughs> corresponds to this whole story <coughs> about Western resolve here again. I, I was positively uh, surprised by the way in which, for instance, Sweden which has had a centuries-long mm. tradition of neutrality, mm. came on board. Finland, if I may say so, just a little bit other story vis-a-vis -vis the war with Russia in uh, 39, mm. etc. But it is an amazing development politically. So that, that's the point. And if I may, if you allow me, um, let me, let me say that in this whole discussion we have the political side and we have the military side and when I look at the um, both dimensions I would actually like to know what we actually mean by winning this war what do we mean by winning this war right from the beginning in February last year when I was asked on television in the Netherlands, what, et cetera, I said, eventually, really eventually, this will amount to the well-known diplomatic formula about agreeing to disagree. To what extent and what content it will take, I don't know. But to my mind, and I, I'm very frank about it, I sometimes have the idea you are talking about Pearl Harbor. I'm talking about this memory of Mr. of President Roosevelt talking about unconditional surrender. And I notice in, in some political layers of our society this idea of unconditional surrender. And that is what is puzzling me. Is that viable to demand of Russia an unconditional surrender? No, no. That's, nobody, nobody that's my that is my problem, and you know, our way of thinking about Russia when they started to bomb cities in Ukraine, I said again and again a self-evident. I made a self-evident observation, which we all know that while we are surprised about the Russians bombing civilian targets, etc., without any scruples, we are talking about collateral damage. The Russians don't know what is collateral damage. They don't count with that sort of uh, beautiful stories. So we have to come to terms with the fact that we have to do something to do something about a power which is now considering itself to be cornered, mm. to be besieged, 
And we have to see how we, at a certain moment in this long war, can bring it to some sort of an end. I can't say it differently. Professor Czaputovic, it was interesting to hear it coming from you as a foreign a minister of foreign affairs of Poland, which is one of the most resolute yeah. against uh, Russia's uh, uh, actions. Uh, does Poland expect uh, there to be a middle ground to be found with Russia on matters of the territorial integrity, so to speak, of, of Ukraine? For the moment, I think that for us, the situation is clear. I don't agree with you. Mm. But some of the things about unconditional surrender by, by Russia. Nobody wants to invade Russian territory. It's a huge country. They okay. occupy part of Ukraine. And what is at stake? The liberation of the territory which belongs to Ukraine, according okay. to international law. And uh, we, as international community, acknowledge that right of the Ukrainians to fight back, to liberate this territory. If even if Ukraine liberates, even Crimea, which uh, in accordance uh, to, to international law, it's, it's part of Ukraine, it does it mean that Russia will uh, have to surrender. Nobody wants to invade Moscow. It, you, you can, I, I don't think we can accept this language. So um, it's important to maintain support for Ukraine because it's a risk. There are many questions. Uh, uh, issues raised like the, uh, that. For us, it's premature to talk about future peace until Ukraine fight. We have to support them because, in other words, we can just weaken their position. We, d we shouldn't weaken position of Ukraine. We have to acknowledge their mm -hmm. right. Of course, maybe it will be a compromise. We'll see everything depends on our support for Ukraine and on the developments in the fields uh, and on fields. European cohesion and considering the fact that we already hear different voices both in Germany and France to leading the European nations does that not start to concern Poland in a certain way no mm. but for, we've noticed a kind of a turn uh, supporting more Ukraine also due to public so to say support and uh, human rights movement in these countries they simply expect from leadership to behave honestly to simply support the weaker, to obey international uh, law, to uh, distinguish between attacker and the victim. So it is moral obligation. It is in accordance with European values. It's not only geopolitics. And societies wants that honest policy from, from the, in democratic countries. So I am far from uh, saying that uh, there is a bigger chance that Ukraine will win, but we have to do our best in supporting supporting uh, Ukraine in, in that war and maintain that support. Ambassador Sakov, what degree does Estonia see that uh, leeway to somewhat have until negotiations should erupt vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia? I mean, one day there will be negotiations. They have to be actually... Uh, one day so far down the road we can't see it. It depends. It depends actually how much support the West is actually providing Ukraine. Because that determines what would be the ramification where the negotiations will, will actually start. What will be at the table or not at the table of negotiations is up for the Ukrainians. No one else can actually tell them, hey, you guys, you have to give up this or that part of the territory. Because this is, uh, I was used to could be, to be called imperialism. Uh, there was a good story, uh, purportedly, uh, happened in Kiev at the beginning of the war, when there was a kind of press pool, uh, and there were uh, Western journalists who were asking Ukrainian ones, okay, hey, negotiations start, what, you, uh, what part of the territory are you going to give away to Russians? Mm -hmm. And the, since the, the, the person who asked was an Italian, the Ukrainian journalist said, oh, we fought in Lombardy, how about that? <laughs> Uh, I think it's kind of a, let's say, and, and, and one uh, addition to, I uh, already talked about Russia and collateral damage, just uh, one uh, addition is that for Russian war, yeah, collateral mm -hmm. damage, uh, bombing civilian targets, it's not a bug, it's a feature. This is intended. They intend to sure. cause harm to civilians sure. and civilian targets. It's not just by accident. Sure. Uh, 
I, st I still want to refer to what I said earlier. We shall support Ukraine until the very end. Notice, to the very end. There is an end coming. Uh, we, we look forward for the end. And as um, uh, Mr. Ambassador from Estonia said that, one day there will be negotiations. But what we think in Finland, it's very important to remember that no one from outside should come and dictate under what circumstances Ukraine negotiate. The, it, Ukraine is an independent country like Finland was 1939. And no one came and said to us that you should give away this part. We, our forefathers, they were negotiating with uh, Russia and they made a peace agreement. And I hope that when we come to the very end with this terrible war in Ukraine, uh, as long as it takes, then Ukraine has the right to lead the negotiations and the peace agreement must be made so that they are satisfied. It needs to accept its transformation, considering the fact that when this war started, it was a failed nation and considered as such by most Western nations. And through this war, it was, it became into a nation state that truly sought that independence and quite uh, uh, is identified as such, at least from what I hear from my who, Ukrainian friends. Who, who considered uh, Ukraine a failed nation? Many was a vibrant democracy, a lot of problems, corruption, things like that. It's a vibrant uh, democracy. The only thing that failed was, of course, that we had a very bad and have a very bad eastern neighbor. And that's a problem. That was a problem from 2014 on, onwards until last year, when this kind of slow going uh, mm. war in Donbass actually uh, uh, amounted to. 14,000 dead Ukrainians, 14,000. Mm. <coughs> and that was an image 17, things like that. And these 14,000 dead Ukrainians uh, was considered to be normal peacetime. Uh, not really. We just didn't but pay attention. We should have. Could, have, could I, uh, with your permission, ask uh, the ambassador the following simple, que simple question? When we talk agreement to disagree, or we'll eventually get into a um, sphere of negotiations and what have you, and Zelensky being on the at the table and talking also with the Moscow and Washington, how should I assess then the simple fact? And it is asked over and over again in the public debate about if, about this. Uh, Crimea, which actually in 2014, 2014, was in the public's eye given up by the West to the Russians. What what should we do about that? It was I, I leave I leave aside Minsk one and Minsk yeah. two. But, but, it, simple. Uh, but I mean, uh, no Western country has ever. Uh, uh, considered Crimea to be a lawful part of uh, of Russian Federation uh, now after 2014. Uh, there are only countries which uh, which basically uh, recognize that as part of Russia are the ones what we usually call terrorist countries. Uh, uh, they um, at that time and times might change, and hopefully for the better. But at, in 2014-15 and so forth. We were actually looking at Crimea in the same way, from legal point of view, as was the case for the Baltic states, occupied for by 50 years. But the West never recognized most of the countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, as parts of, parts of a legitimate part of the Soviet Union. We were considered occupied countries. In the United States, there is every year, there is one day is captured Nations Day, Oh. When Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian okay. diplomats who were still serving okay. in Washington were invited to the White House to meet okay. with the president. Okay. They, in a foyer of a State Department, in fi for those 50 years, Estonian national flag was flying all the time. By the way, that Estonian diplomat in the end, he was like 92 when he was able to hand over his baton to a newly appointed ambassador of a free Estonia in 1992. Very interesting indeed. Well. Uh, I'd like to go to our, our next topic, and that is uh, very much integrated with this, because uh, even though Europe attempted 
many times over to uh, isolate, of course, together with the United States, the West at large, tried to isolate Russia following uh, its invasion of its uh, Western neighbor, Ukraine. Uh, ultimately, uh, it, it failed to do so to a certain degree because of those terror sponsor states or terror states or uh, non-aligned states uh, with Western uh, uh, cohesion to that matter. I'd like to start with you, Professor Chepertovich. Uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, has been supplying uh, Russia with various means, including, of course, uh, uh, one-way uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, causing, obviously, substantive devastation throughout Ukraine. But uh, while this is a topic that uh, we could talk extensively about, I'd like to focus actually about the nuclear aspect of things, since Russia is assisting Iran in uh, its civilian, at least proclaiming to do so, uh, nuclear program. Uh, it is also one of the P5 plus one, which ultimately established the initial Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal, uh, which was supposed to safeguard and, and thwart Iranian activities uh, related uh, to nuclear pro proliferation. But at the same time, this evolved and developed into a point where today we see an Iran uh, that has probably, and there are still open investigations by the International Atomic Energy Agency into those matters, there were three undeclared sites throughout Iran that were... Uh, obviously in breach of its non-proliferation treaty obligations and it continues to accumulate nuclear materials. Just recently the IAEA published a report uh, to its Board of Governors in which it notified that it already uh, managed to reach 84 percent enriched uranium, which obviously is staggering since it's four percent more than the nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and 6% shy of uh, nuclear weapons of today's 21st century caliber. Can we sustain another country like North Korea so much closer to Europe with obviously no issue of targeting Europe on, on European soil? No, that's a very serious question for internet, global security, particularly for Israel. Uh, Iran creates a threat, uh, uh, threatens uh, Israel. Uh, European Union is part uh, to JCPOA. There is still a slight hope that it may be somehow uh, obeyed uh, by Iran in future. Uh, President Trump withdrew from, 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 from that treaty in 2018. But I agree, this, this is a very difficult situation. Uh, and um, the problem is that um, Poland is m <coughs> more understanding the U.S. and Israel in that case, but some European countries want to um, maintain the treaty. For them, Iran is not a threat. They recognize uh, <coughs> Iran's right to sovereignty, to independent policy. Um, even accept, maybe in future it may happen that they will have nuclear weapons. Uh, like Pakistan or India, and there is a hope that they will change their policy due to the fact that uh, nuclear countries behave more, so to say, a responsible way. So there is a theory about that. So, but I agree that it's very important uh, um, development, and I see this alliance against Western countries, Iran, China currently, uh, Russia, Arab countries, Belarus recently, yesterday, there was a, vi a visit of Lukashenko to Tehran signing an agreement. And it looks more like a, a war by proxy. Russia on the one side, supporting by these autocratic countries and Ukraine by democratic world. Uh, it's a negative development. Uh, not certain what would be the end of, the, of that confrontation and of that development, but we have to simply you know, do our job. So, be united within the West, also in relation in relations to Iran, not only to Russia uh, concerning the war in Ukraine, but to Iran. And um, there is a chance, I think, that we are still united. American leadership here is crucial. Mm. May, may I comment here that uh, I, I would say I, I look uh, the same way upon this issue as 
as um, my friend from Poland, because uh, Israel has been warning uh, the Western world for years about this. Uh, the Republican administration has been aware of this. But Europe has, once again, we have been way too naive, especially when, when it comes to the, the European Union and the parliament decisions there. Uh, there has been made a lot of resolutions, but they have not no noticed this, that uh, there is really a nuclear threat, although Israel and US has warned us. So now it's time to wake up. And I think that the Russian war, when, they, when we see that, that Iran is delivering defense material to Russia, this is the, the late wake up call for Europe. Hey, we need to look upon this. And I hope that the European Parliament will quickly make some resolution in this issue. Ambassador Sacco? I would say that, I mean, I have a, a following related comment uh, on this issue. And this actually shows that there are no faraway quest, uh, countries with faraway problems, uh, what we do not really want to know too much about it. Because, I mean, let's see. Uh, they, what happens in the Middle East, in Iran, actually has an effect on European security. Mm. Directly now, through Russia being supplied by Iran with drones and attacking mm. Ukraine, right? And vice versa. Uh, they, what is happening on a battlefield and how far they, uh, this nexus uh, between Russian Federation and Iran is going to develop in terms of a technological and military weapons transfer uh, will have or might have an effect by CESA then on the Middle East and security then Russian aircraft and missiles technology start actually arriving. Well, it basically shows that uh, we should be very attuned to each other's issues, uh, problems and threats. Of course, we saw uh, images just uh, this past week of uh, the first Iranian um, cadet uh, training on the Sukhoi 35 and uh, having quite uh, uh, the uh, stand innovation of the Russian pilots, uh, which uh, indicates, of course, that there are going to be substantive transactions on that matter, uh, just in a corridor of a place which has, uh, of course, a third of uh, global oil output. Uh, generate much of the energy of the world, uh, including the LNG coming into Europe uh, from Qatar, among others. So that's quite interesting. Professor Rosenthal? Yeah, well, uh, let, let's face uh, the situation right now with Iran getting together with the Saudis, restoring diplomatic relations there. Under China's umbrella. With China involved, as China is also trying now, you know, on the European end, to to cause some sort to bring about some sort of miracle by Xi Jinping going for, to Putin and afterwards, if he could have the word going to uh, Zelensky, you know, China is playing its role. With regard to Iran, let me say that with the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, 2015, there were so many holes in the in in the deal you know um, it, it always reminded me of this famous anecdote by uh, uh, a western diplomat asking uh, uh, Chu Lai what will be the outcome of 1789 the french revolution and uh, Chu Lai answering too early to tell the joint plan of action is uh, was a time span of five or ten years and will be again if it would be arranged, which we can seriously doubt, will be again a time span of a couple of years for the Iranians, as far as I understand it from history, historians, their time span is so much longer. So what is actually the outcome of this? That's one. Secondly, if you look really at the IAEA reports right now, it is history revisited from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It is about inspections which actually don't deserve that word. It is about, at the moment, dismantling the IAA uh, equipment uh, for surveillance in the uh, nuclear sites in Iran. We are talking a country 
whether we like it or not, which is playing the game of hostage diplomacy. Exchanging one, a, ex a, exchanging one hostage for hundreds of billions of dollars. Indeed. And it's easy to say that is terrible and it shouldn't be done from a sort of moral side. But on the other hand, look at the pressure of public opinion in Western countries when there is a hostage being taken by the Iranians, Belgium, the same story. And we are talking uh, nasty, realistic politics here. You know, that's, that's the story about Iran. And the only story here from a Western perspective is a policy of containment. What is the solution? Well, uh, uh, when, when we look at Iran at the moment, you can, you can just uh, accumulate it. Uh, we have Ukraine, the drones. We have the regional destabilization. We have the um, uh, problem of the hostages. We have the problem with Iran about the, demo the demonstrations which are going on since September last year. And when, which, according to some of the experts, indeed for the first time is a story about a sort of loss of legitimacy on the part of the Ayatollah regime. So if it is about Iran, I would ultimately and very tentatively say that if there should be something happening about Iran, it will, it will have to come from the inside. And it is very doubtful whether it will come from Western operations, Western activities, or what have you. Well, we'll most definitely have to revisit this topic in the future as we uh, fail or lack to do so every time anew. But I'd like to thank Professor Rosenthal, uh, Professor Chaputovic, Ambassador Sakov, and Mr. Ostman as well. I'd like to thank all of you at home. We encourage you. Communicate with your local representatives, your government officials representing you, of course, uh, to do more on the topics we discuss here today. Sometimes a little bit of a push is helpful uh, when it comes to po uh, political realms. But uh, until next time, from me here in Helsinki, good evening. <laughs> <laughs>